Hello. On behalf of Abbott Vascular, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in a series of webinars on our recent project examining the roles of data and technology in shaping the future of vascular medicine. Many of you may have already read our white paper titled Beyond Intervention, Personalized Vascular Care Through Technological Innovation. And today we will discuss in more detail some of the issues raised in that document. For those who are yet to read the paper, I would encourage you to do so. It's freely available via the link on the registration page for this webcast. Or you can visit cardiovascular.abbott slash beyond intervention, where it can be downloaded. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Nick West, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Abbott Vascular. Although I have to say, as a former practicing interventional cardiologist, this project has reinvigorated my hope for a better and more patient-centric healthcare environment for all elements in the space. I'm going to start with some bold things for the future. What is the future of vascular and medical care? Well, within 20 years, physicians and patients will trust data, algorithms and machines to determine patient treatments. Patient follow-up, furthermore, will be practically all remote, driven by telemedicine, wearables, and also external partners. And I think it goes without saying that the design of the healthcare ecosystem will be barely visible from today. So all that said, please listen for the next 50 minutes or so as I discuss with thought leaders in the space to discuss how and why these prophecies may come true and how data and technology technology will get us there. I'm very pleased joined by three forward thinkers with expertise across the healthcare and scientific spectrum. First, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Cohen Delosa, a vascular surgeon from Dendermonde in Belgium, with a particular interest and expertise in endovascular or minimally invasive methods to treat peripheral arterial disease. I'm also joined by Dr. Natalia Penile Echeverri, an interventional cardiologist from McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, whose specialization encompasses advanced intracoronary Im imaging methods. Finally, I'm joined by Manish Juneja, a digital health futurist and internet thought leader whose recent experiences with use of wearables and remote monitoring in the context of his own illness with COVID-19 will, I'm sure, color our discussions. So, what is the state of vascular care? I think it goes without saying to many listeners that cardiovascular diseases remain the leading cause of death worldwide, claiming around 18 million lives annually. But of course, it's not just the deaths, it's the lost years of uh, loved ones' lives, it's the poor quality, the disability that is caught, brought on by vascular diseases, not only coronary heart disease, but also peripheral vascular disease and cerebrovascular disease, and there is no doubt that this burden will continue to grow. At the same time, today's health care systems have never been more challenged. They are fragmented in terms of the teams and the communication between individuals and teams. There are economic challenges and disjointed data streams across the care continuum. This results in care providers who feel overwhelmed, patients who don't believe their unique conditions are fully understood. And healthcare systems tend to emphasize intervention and fixing things rather than harnessing the power of data to optimize care across the entire patient journey. The management of cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease, renovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease worldwide has reached an inflection point with the convergence of these macro trends. And there is an urgent need for novel and innovative solutions. But just before we get into the discussions, I do want to introduce a piece of primary research that we performed that the white paper is based upon. And we were particularly interested in this survey to address optimization of the patient treatment pathway to enable greater confidence in ensuring each patient is getting the best treatment at the right time in a personalized fashion, trying to look at improving the workflow, improving the rates of misdiagnosis or underdiagnosis, and reducing variability between physicians and hospital systems, and perhaps looking to define what is it that makes up health data in the 21st century and beyond. This is a survey we performed. 
We wanted a global view of how cardiovascular treatments could improve. We asked nearly 1,500 physicians, administrators, and patients over the last 12 months in nine geographies. We surveyed 1,000 patients. All of the patients were 35 or older. The majority, 70%, had coronary heart disease, but 30% had peripheral arterial disease. We also surveyed nearly 400 physicians, just cardiologists, but other specialists who refer to interventional cardiologists, vascular surgeons, or indeed interventional radiologists. And also uniquely, we surveyed around 130 hospital administrators and payers to get an idea of the feelings of those responsible for the selection, purchase, and negotiation of devices and services. These are really the headlines from the study. Patients are frustrated by the care they're receiving. They want it personalized to them. Physicians lament the lack of time they have to spend with their patients. Administrators are understandably pressured to deliver satisfaction for patients against the costs incurred. And it is more or less unanimous across the survey that diagnostic and data-driven technologies hold the promise to unlock a more holistic whole patient view. So, how can we optimize the patient treatment pathway experience by using data? And more importantly, what does personalized care look like? Perhaps I can ask Natalia, tell us a little bit about what your patients think that personalized healthcare looks like. So, personalized uh, healthcare uh, means to me that there has to be a good interaction between uh, patients and physicians in order to decide um, their goals of treatment, a proper diagnosis, and the outcomes they want to achieve. And both need to uh, interact uh, in the best way of possible to decide uh, what is uh, personalized care for, for each patient. And comes to my mind that uh, we need to uh, have uh, a real interaction with the patient's background and information um, in his healthcare journey to understand uh, what he needs. And often physicians, we make decisions uh, based on uh, what is known about the disease, what is known about the therapeutic options, um, but maybe we don't take enough time to personalize those options to each patient in particular. So, yeah, maybe uh, if someone wants to share a patient experience, like that, that will help to uh, understand this topic. Cohen, I think yes, you've got uh, an example of a patient. Yes, Natalia, what you are saying and what is mentioned over here in terms of personal, personalized healthcare was completely reflected last week when I've seen a patient on the vascular consultation. He did it, he visited already uh, three different hospitals three different departments of vascular surgery and three different vascular surgeons. The first was mentioning to him, based on a duplex ultrasound, that probably walking exercises, supervised walking exercises, would be the best for the patients. He visited a second one, saying that bypass was the ultimate way to solve his claudication problem. And then last but not least, he visited a third hospital, where they've mentioned, no, supervised exercise therapy is not going to uh, solve your problem. Bypass surgery will solve your problem. It's probably too aggressive, too invasive. So we can offer you a minimal invasive endovascular treatment. And so based on these three professional advices, the patient arrived uh, with a fourth vascular surgeon, with me. And so I needed to explain him based on available duplex ultrasounds, available CTs or MRs, uh, what was the best solution for him. So, and the best solution for him is not per definition the best solution for the next patient. So that's for me a clear proof that we are still far away from personalized healthcare. Thanks, Kieran. That's That's very interesting. And from the survey, I think the points that came up very clearly from a vascular patient's perspective are some of the notes that both you and Natalia have hit. More face-to-face -face interaction and time with the doctor is wanted and required. A two-way consultative patient-doctor relationship. And as you said, an individualized treatment plan 
based on the doctor's ability to review relevant data pertaining to successes in similar patients, but also critically taking into account the patient's wishes. And of course, part of this is also about effective and seamless information sharing along the entire continuum. And that's really what facilitates it. I'm but just going to ask Manish. I... Manish, yes. yeah, give us your comment. You, I think you've recently been on the receiving end of this. So uh, yes, give us so your view. This is really interesting because uh, when I had my symptoms and I wasn't sure if they were COVID or not, um, I went to the, the government website and the healthcare system and there's this online symptom checker. Oh, cool, I can put in my symptoms. It came back, oh, you don't have COVID, just take honey and lemon. I was like, really? Um, and then I kind of like... I, 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 I still didn't feel very comfortable because it was very difficult to speak to a doctor in those days early in April um, when my symptoms began. So finally, I got through to my human GP and my human GP listened to all my symptoms for 10 minutes. She was confused because it didn't match the guidelines or the case definition of COVID. But because she really listened to me and wanted to personalize my care, plus I was able to share some of the patient generated data from my fitness wearables and even some of my medical wearables that I have at home, she was able to come up with a diagnosis of suspected COVID-19 over the phone without examining me. But it, like, it, it was like really interesting how compared to the sort of, well, let's have symptom checkers for everybody and we don't even need human doctors to diagnose you. Well, this is where, again, personalized healthcare for me means that we, we need uh, good human physicians that can listen attentively even more than just let's throw lots of technology against the problem and the symptom checker and online tools can personalize the experience. And I think you also had, uh, you had a point to make about sharing when you finally got to the point of referral, sharing your information and having a part in the diagnosis and the treatment pathway. Oh yeah, that's right. So um, it's, also the fact that when I've seen these different specialists as my symptoms have progressed and I've had to carry around pieces of information, both from uh, visits to other specialists in other countries, uh, my uh, main medical record that I printed out online, um, and then also the data from my, uh, my wearables, et cetera. It's like, wow, this, is a, um, this personalization of care is almost like at the moment a big burden on the patient themselves to try and help the physician, but it did help the, the doctors that I saw in terms of because I guess I had put in the hard work to bring all this different disparate data together and email it across to them. That's very interesting. I'm just going to, uh, I should have asked the audience uh, just to encourage you, as you may have seen on this platform, there is an online chat or Q&A function. Please feel free to send questions. We've actually had one through already, which is what prompted me. So I'm just going to, it's more of a statement, really, and I think it backs up what you've just said, Manish. Uh, but the, but the, the question or statement is that patients want personalized medical care, but generally, present company excluded, don't have the time, motivation, or background to go out and get it. Healthcare providers, therefore, cannot personalize care effectively without the patient's active and ongoing participation. And the, real, the question is, how can technology bridge the gap? Now, I'm not going to ask you to answer that because that's the, that's the entire webcast, but I hope that we'll probably come to answering some of that uh, question statement with question as we go through. So please do send your questions in via the, the, the Q&A chat box, and we'll answer as many as we possibly can uh, at the end of uh, this webinar. So if I can perhaps change gear now, we, we've talked a bit uh, about the treatment care pathway, but how can we improve this, make it more efficient as a workflow for both patients and their physicians? And I think we've touched on some of this already, but this really also relates to the problems that administrators see. They're the ones that often have to design these pathways to facilitate both patient satisfaction, not too much cost incurred, and enable their physicians and allied health professionals to deliver the kind of care that patients want in a timely fashion. Just these are some bullet points that the administrators in our survey highlighted, a lack of tools to aid with medication change adherence and lifestyle changes, lack of insight into aftercare and treatment adherence, a scarcity of time spent with each patient, much like physicians felt, scarce resources for patients to make lifestyle changes, and lack of appropriate post-care facilities 
for recovery. So I, I want to go, go back to the point about lack of insight into aftercare and treatment adherence, because I know, Cohen, this is something that you're particularly interested in, the doctor-patient, if you like, contract. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this is all always a little bit uh, also my skepticism to this uh, uh, telemedicine, telehealth in, in general, so that it is a, a too much uh, a one-sided relationship. And, and I think this is very important to stress over here. So um, what, is, what is so interesting right at the moment is this very close and confidential uh, patient-doctor relationship, and we cannot lose this relationship. And like I've mentioned, it, it's a two ways. It works in, in the two directions. On one side, of course, the physician has a maximum of responsibility for the patient well-being to solve his problem, to uh, prevent problems, also to take care after solving the problem. But on the other hand, and we all know this as physicians, also the responsibility of the patient is extremely important. Um, and we cannot l lose this, that's extremely important. When he needs to stop smoking, he, needs to, he really needs to stop smoking, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. If uh, he needs to bring a maximum of compliance in terms of uh, uh, medicaments uh, intake afterwards, extremely important. Just implanting a stent in a claudicant doesn't make any sense. We need walking exercises afterwards. So also the patient has a very important responsibility and together I'm sure with administrations, with physicians and centrally positioned a patient, we can offer him the best personalized, personalized care. I think this is a very important is. point, a very important point indeed, because certainly as a, as a, a med tech company, as you've pointed out, there has been a real focus on the fixing. It's all about the stent or the div to fix the physical problem. But really, you know, if we want to tackle vascular care head on, it's not necessarily going to be about more stents or more pacemakers or more grafts or whatever it might be. We've got to think much more holistically. And that's where all of these data pieces come in, if you like. And I think you know, I speak now as a, 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 as a mouthpiece of a, uh, of a med tech company, but as a, previously as a physician, as you, see a, you see a patient throughout their care journey. You don't just see them at the time where they have that single intervention. And I think that in healthcare systems where that is the case, where doing the procedure is the end of the road, that's probably where some of this doctor pays a relationship, but contract breaks down a bit. And as we've heard, some of the frailties of healthcare systems in the 21st century, economic and time-wise, may be exacerbating this. Natalia, and any thoughts on, on this process? Does this resonate with you? Yeah, I want to comment that I have to say that during the pandemic, uh, telemedicine, we have had the chance to, to live in the telemedicine as never before. And it's been interesting how the patients um, have um, assumed like a role in, the, in their health that they didn't before. So I totally agree that the face-to-face -face interaction cannot be loose. Uh, but I have found telemedicine very interesting, um, at least for this gap of pre and post intervention, uh, because never before, or honestly, for me, in the pandemic, I have never before felt as close as my patients just by a phone call or by a, a teleconference connection. And my ability, my availability to see the patients are higher, like is definitely high. And the patients don't have to struggle with many of the gaps like during this whole journey. So they don't have to come to hospitals. They don't have to include their families in transport, waiting rooms, parkings, like in a lot of things. So um, this telemedicine is telling us that there are other ways to connect with patients because that interaction with the patient is the most important thing and um, probably will help us. Like before, I used to see my patients uh, that I deploy a stand for, for a heart attack, uh, probably in a six months, one year time frame. Uh, now, because it's not as difficult, I can just call my patients two weeks after the procedure, one month after the procedure, and, uh, and feel closer to them and helping them to go through the after intervention and understand better the pre-intervention. So 
Uh, this pandemic time is giving us an important time to realize that there are other ways for an interaction with the patients. Cohen, can I ask you about this? Because I was speaking to a vascular surgeon from New York on a webinar last week who actually flipped this around and said that telemedicine in the field of vascular surgery actually, she felt, might be doing more harm than good. Now, this is a controversial viewpoint. You can talk to the patient, but can you really assess wound healing and or the presence or the advancement to CLI from a telemedical consultation without physically seeing the patient's foot, taking their, taking their shoe and sock off in front of you? Yeah, very good point. And, and I, I, I need to agree with uh, Natalia that, that for the follow-up of Claudicon's prevention, uh, guiding our patients uh, with all the, the comorbidities, correcting the tension, uh, taking the, the, the right antiplatelets and so on, that telemedicine is perfect for this. But as you mentioned, and as my New York colleague mentioned, for some subpopulations, especially in peripheral arterial disease, it can be a, a problem. And I, of course, we are thinking immediately on our CLI group, uh, the critical limb ischemia uh, group of patients, what, uh, who are, by the way, not always uh, in the most, how can I say, most social uh, 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 preferential uh, environments. Uh, they have uh, difficulties with access to all kinds of, of uh, internet and, and connections. Um, so, and as you mentioned, Nick, completely right. Um, and that's the point where I need to see uh, jumping in of technology. I'm sure that in the future, we will have appropriate tools to evaluate in an as good way as life a wound, uh, a wound uh, uh, healing process, that we need to see the ulcers, but that we can judge this in a, in a perfect uh, uh, with a perfect uh, technology tool in order to analyze uh, the, the, the size, the depth, uh, the granulation, tissue formation, and so on. Um, and of course, there are already examples where, for instance, where you can implant sensors uh, measuring uh, um, the oxygen in the, in the foot, for instance, or in the environment of the, the healing ulcer to, to see to follow the uh, increase or decrease of oxygen tension in this area and in this way from a, a, a tele, telemedicine perspective to follow the wound healing process. We're going to get into the issue of sensors, wearables and other interesting ways of following up in due course. But I think Nick, this I is probably a, a good... Question. I have a yeah, quick response Denise, yeah, about, about efficient workflow for patients and their physicians. So uh, recently when my COVID symptoms have been ongoing and long-term issues and my GP was calling me on a regular basis to check in and monitor me, I said to her one day, I know that you've got a technical system whereby I can go onto the internet and I can just submit my patient-generated data. We don't have to have this phone call. It's, it's efficient for you, it's efficient for me, right? And she said to me, but Manish, it's not efficient. I said, what do you mean? And she says, I don't just want to see the data from your pulse ox or your heart rate monitor. I want to actually hear your voice. I can tell so much just by listening to you as you're describing how you're feeling and uh, the, the, the stories you're telling about your symptoms that I need that soft data from the interaction on the phone as well as the hard data from all your sensors you've got. And I went, Oh, that's a really interesting viewpoint. I never thought about it like that. I was trying to save her time and to save me time. So it's really interesting when we think about workflows that our first, our first thoughts about efficiency may not actually be the best ones from, a, 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 from the sort of keeping the humanity and healthcare perspective. That's very, very interesting. And in fact, I, you didn't touch on it, but as you'll, I'm sure, be aware, there are a lot of startup companies using things like voice pattern recognition to try and diagnose both uh, illnesses, but also there's been uh, quite a lot of use in the COVID era in terms of assessing breathlessness and breakup of sentences to try and gauge severity of symptoms. I think this will be a good time to just pivot to the next section, but I'm going to leave you with this thought, which has come from the audience, and it is a thought, and I'm not sure there is a clear answer to this. 
Healthcare administration has put so much money into electronic medical record systems with little return on investment. That may be controversial in itself. But how can we harness the data that's held within these electronic patient records to affect the patient experience and outcomes, and in particular, when many of them don't speak to each other? Does anyone want a, a, a quick comment on that? Natalia, I think you've got a feeling about this. <laughs> yeah, I... I think the, the view about electronic medical records from administrate, like administrators and physicians and patients is completely different. So it's not about how fancy or how advanced is the electronic medical system we have in our hospitals. It's about the unification of the information. And uh, I don't care how the blood work or the CT scan results appear in my computer or how fast I can get it. What I'm interested in is like if my patient went to an ER department in another city in Canada, that I have access to that data. So the view from the views are very, very different. So what is efficient for administrators may, may not be efficient for us as physicians. And as what we want from the physician perspective is have access to uh, the majority of the information, tests, uh, ER visits, specialized visits from the patients. And I think that's not a reality nowadays and not even uh, in a city level. So we cannot even talk about a uh, country level. Uh, we don't have that. Okay. Pro probably I, I can jump in here because, as you know, Belgium is a very small country with only 11 million of, of, of people. So, so here we have already a national e-health platform. So where a lot of data uh, are available in a national way. Um, and, and this is not the task for physicians, for patients, even not for administra administrators. This is a political decision. This is political goodwill we need. And, and, and still right up today, there are some political groups that saying that the privacy of data is much more important than sharing in the national healthcare systems all the, the data that we have available of our patients. So, so this struggle in between privacy and, and, and the availability of healthcare data is a political discussion and we are not really influence, influenceable over there. My, my feeling is the patient point of view. Yeah. So my, 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 what I'm seeing is a, a trend emerging that we are seeing the grassroots movement where we're not going to wait for the healthcare system itself to link the primary care data set and secondary care data set and specialist cancer clinic data sets together. Patients are going to use these new technologies that are emerging and there are companies building their own ecosystems so that I, as a patient, can pull my electronic medical record data, then I can pull data from other sources. I can create a 360 view of my life as a patient with a certain disease, and I choose which physicians, which institutions I share with, whether I share my data for medical research. That's my kind of sort of um, provocative view of 20 years down the line. Things will be dramatically different in terms of who actually chooses what gets done and what gets shared and where that data flows. I was going to say, actually, that the future may not be so different from the present in certain countries. Now, I know that electronic patient records aren't joined up, but I can tell you, and I don't know whether Natalia, Manish, Cohen, you have experience of perhaps healthcare in India, but I've been over there for, for proctoring and training. Not at all uncommon for patients, it's not electronic, but literally to have a big bag under their arm of all their records, and they will go around from place to place, and they will not quite shop around for the best opinion, but they will take all of their data that they've amassed from different places to the next position. Manish, you're nodding a lot. This is obviously a, a cultural thing that resonates. Well, it's just because um, uh, even when I've spoken to relatives in India and they are even um, contacting their physician at 11 p.m. on WhatsApp, and even in Brazil, where I've, I've got friends there, and they are sharing medical and all, they're sharing information about their health and getting real-time feedback and, sh and, sh and they're getting lab test results via WhatsApp. So there's this sort of, as you point out, culturally, um, there are different things happening in different parts of the world when it comes to data and technology and how it's used by patients to interact with physicians. I think it's, it's fascinating that we, we appreciate that different 
patients are doing things in a different way with different physicians. So it's very interesting, the point you raise. We're talking about this flow of data. We've, we, first of all, we've said in some areas, there's not enough data, but in other areas, there's data flowing all night. And I think, Cohen, one of your concerns, going back to this business of the patient-physician contract and adherence, is that what if all this data is coming to you somehow when you might be justifiably asleep or not at work? Yeah, that's that's correct. And and there are actually um, two points, uh, two remarks on this. Um, first of all, uh, um, although I'm, I, I love India and I love Brazil, but luckily I'm not a physician over there because this is for me impossible to get at 3 uh, uh, a.m. a WhatsApp of a patient uh, to tell him or to tell me that, that he has some uh, ischemic leg or a de deterioration of his ankle brachial index. So, so that's, that's one thing. Um, you need to take care of the physician of the physicians also, because otherwise we're going to see uh, a lot of more burnouts and depressed, depressive syndromes uh, in, in our physician group. That's one point. And the second point, probably more, even more important is the, the legal uh, consequences of all of this. Imagine I have a patient uh, with uh, that I'm following in a remote control with uh, ankle brachial index or with uh, 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 oxygen measurements. And uh, over a couple of days when I'm on holidays or not on call or whatever, uh, there was a deterioration of these uh, ankle brachial indexes of oxygen tensions. And so by having this after a couple of days, it end up in a full deterioration in an amputation or whatever. So who is responsible for this? Is it the physician who didn't see um, this evolution in the parameters in a remote way? Or is it the patient himself? Or is it the system? Uh, legal responsibility here needs to be very well defined. I think that's a very so good point. I'm gonna... you, make, you make a very good point that makes me think about the fact that we are facing a future where we're going to have all these different data-driven insights and sensors all over the place and physicians I speak to and administrators are scared like information obesity and I'm going to be sitting there and I train to become a physician and essentially I'm just doing data science looking at everybody's data sets all day long and so the interesting thing when they talk about all this data and AI and algorithms and predicting things is well just so you might generate an insight on a particular patient and maybe you may be remotely monitoring a patient and their sensor generates an insight or a signal. So the problem for healthcare systems of their structure today, and especially when it comes to resources, is do you have the resources to act upon each signal that comes in to your practice or your clinic digitally? There's this signal deterioration. And so that's, again, a big challenge in terms of these workflows. How, how do we do we just say we can't handle any new signals until we work out this workflow, or do we just kind of adapt as we go along and, and see what happens? I think that's a, probably a question that would take more than the allotted time that we have to, today to answer it. But I just want to close this section before we move on to talk a bit about misdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. Uh, this is another question from the audience. I'm going to pose it as a rhetorical question because I think it, that's the sense it's been posed in. Who should own the data? Should patients own their data rather than a variety of hospital systems and providers that tend to fragment patient information? For example, x-ray reports may be stored at one hospital, annual health checkup with the primary care physician, and speciality investigations may be with the particular specialist physician or surgeon they've seen. Shouldn't there be a way for patients to have all of their information readily available for themselves and their providers? I would say that the problem is that there are some patients who will want that, and there may be some patients who really don't want that, and they, they want the physician to be in charge of that for them. At any rate, let's, let's go on now and just talk a bit about diagnosis. So one of the things that came out in the survey was that, is there a way that technology and data insights can stop us either under-diagnosing or misdiagnosing people and critically reducing variability. So what we mean by that is that one of your relatives is admitted to hospital with a heart attack or with an ischemic leg, for example. Will they get the same kind of care no matter where they present? Will the physician or surgeon looking after them be able to do the same kind of job? 
And this is a perennial problem for healthcare, the inequalities or perceived inequalities or perceived differences between what's available. And I think if I just want to, if I just share with you some of the insights, as you can see here, the answers for physicians and for administrators, physicians are in uh, sort of reddish pink, physicians in indigo violet color, you can see that technology is felt to have the greatest ability to aid decision making at diagnosis and then when determining the treatment pathway. Natalia, imaging is one of these technologies that helps in terms of diagnosis and determining treatment pathway. Tell us your view and any insights you may have into this. Thanks, Nick. So I reflect every day about all of these technologies because I feel very lucky that I'm practicing medicine at this time where we have amazing diagnostic uh, tools that help us to decide the appropriate treatment for the patients. And, and I reflect on this. Uh, I love Manish's story about his physician missing to listen his voice and having a contact with him. But it's true that these days, we listen to patients with chest pain, and we may or not get the right diagnosis just by listening to the patients or just by doing an examination. And, and I will say 50% or more, like we are wrong just by listening to our patients. And that's why medicine has been pushed to develop like amazing diagnostic tools. So um, I reflect in, a, in this topic with a story of one of my patients, she was only 25, and you get really worried when you get a patient that is younger than you. Uh, she works in business in Canada, and she got sick in every single uh, city, Vancouver, Quebec, Montreal. And finally, she came here to Hamilton and said, over the last two months, I haven't been able to work because every time I fly to a place, I get a heart attack and admitted into hospital, I get the same reflection from the physicians that I'm very young, that I don't have enough risk factors to have a heart attack, and that my treatment should be just medications. And she was misdiagnosed uh, with, um, with um, a diagnosis in cardiology that is called spontaneous coronary artery dissection based on her age and her gender and just her story. Uh, and when she came to me, it was the fifth time she was in hospital. So she said, by my age, like at my age, I cannot believe there are no better diagnostic techniques that can help me to get out of these journey in hospitals every week. And at that point, I just use a very special intracoronary imaging technique that is called OCT. And I did the right diagnosis and I decide the right treatment for her in that admission. So I think physicians and mostly the ones that we have been trained in a very traditional way, we have to open our minds that diagnostic techniques uh, help us to get the right diagnosis and decide the right treatment. And our mind cannot be so close to think that just listening to patients and examination will give us the right diagnosis. So that's interesting. Manish, I think you had a view on, in particular, given your recent experience, about how technology could help at diagnosis. I know you had some words to say about the online uh, function to diagnose COVID, but perhaps uh, there are some other insights there you can offer us. Yeah, I mean, so uh, my GP, when I, I was just mentioning in the first phone call when I was telling her my initial symptoms, and she wasn't able to really do, or kind of, she wasn't able to detect that much simply by being on the end of the telephone. So then I mentioned, look, I've got 2,000 pounds worth of wearables and consumer devices at home with a bunch of sensors. Uh, would any of that data be valuable if I sh share that with you now from my bed of my resting heart rate at night, for example, even though it's a fitness device that normally pre-pandemic, most physicians would just say, I don't trust that data. It's come from a sensor that isn't a medical device. It's not validated. I don't know if it's accurate or not. Suddenly, my GP is saying in this pandemic situation, Manish, whatever you've got, bring it. So I spent about 15 minutes with her, sharing all the data from my different sensors. Um, and it, she was like, just, and then it actually went, she actually recorded it. I could see after the phone call in my, electro, in my app on, a, I could see it in my medical record. She'd recorded all the data from my bed or my smart ring or my smart watch and the ECG I'd done at home with her on the phone to determine if I have AFib or not. Um, and she'd put that all into my medical record and then it helped her in making a decision and a diagnosis. But I was actually um, thinking about 
in, the, in terms of in the future, will it be that given that the global population is 8 billion people and it's growing all the time, um, a lot of technology people are saying we can develop AI or algorithms that can scan an image or they can, you can go online and you can do some triage and symptom checking. Now, could it be that over the next 20 years, as those emerging technologies and algorithms improve and their diagnostic accuracy gets proven and validated in research settings, could it be that in 20 years' time, some patients who are used to a world of on-demand services say, I prefer to use the machine or the algorithm online and pay $10 for the online diagnostic service because that's available at 3 a.m. when my human physician is sleeping and there's a four-hour wait at the ER. That's controversial. That's controversial. And again, that's very, uh, very far-sighted. But it does, as you say, overcome the issue of the nighttime problem. And I think if we get to a stage where if we can inform through artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms, actually, it will be a great leveler. You may not get the absolute best opinion. You certainly won't get the worst opinion, but you will get, if you like, something in the middle. And it will at least be consistent, I guess, is what you're saying. Now, and also we talked, very quickly, Natalia, sorry, yeah. sorry, very quickly, I wanted to add, will it be, again, as, as patients are becoming more empowered and aware of technology and what's happening, Will they say, I won't choose a physician unless I know they are using an AI system to help them in their clinical decision making when it comes to a diagnosis or treatment pathway? Or I'm going to choose a hospital with my insurance policy. I'm going to choose a hospital that uses a particular brand of AI from a tech company because that's what I trust myself as a patient. So this is fascinating because this is, if you like, a democratization of healthcare. And I'm sure that both Kern and Natalia will agree with this, that sometimes when you're in the middle of a procedure or operation, you might want a sort of a second opinion, but equally, you can't do a procedure by committee. You can't say, hands up who thinks we should do this, hands up who thinks we should do that, and go with the biggest vote. So this, if you like, drifts away from the primacy of the physician as the sort of the holder of the arcane knowledge. And then it's much more about sharing the information, developing that into a decision aid, if you like. And, and there are ways of doing this already by putting information into a, like a, a data lake uh, with the correct analytics and algorithms. And, and I'm sure, Manish, you can talk to this in a moment when we come on to some of the, the, the more unconventional data streams. But we, we've spoke, spoken already about Natalia, and you've spoken about OCT being a, a very real tool that could clarify the diagnosis for your patient. Manish, we've talked about non-invasive measures that helped you, but Kona, I just want to focus on peripheral arterial disease because in terms of critical limb ischemia, as you've admitted, there isn't really the tool. Yeah, completely right. And, 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 and there, um, I, I want to add uh, not only uh, uh, pre-diagnosis, at diagnosis, but also even during intervention, and um, um, I, I'm a hundred percent believer, like Natalia uh, uh, told us uh, about OCT images, uh, uh, iris images. These are very objective, clear-cut images that you can make. Also, the parameters that Manish was uh, mentioning about a heart uh, beat uh, rate, uh, um, uh, blood pressure, and whatever. But for instance, as you referring um, Nick to uh, critical limb ischemia. Uh, uh, situations. Uh, we all know that we have uh, three tibial vessels, well, um, and we have an ulcer. So it, the relationship in between is not that easy. First question, is the ulcer caused by arterial insufficiency? Or is it neuropathy? Or is it uh, too much pressure on one point based on, on foot deformity? This is already very unclear to determine. Second point, if we decide, uh, probably with the uh, aid of uh, AI systems, that uh, uh, at least there is an important vascular component, then we go to revascularize the tibial vessels. Do we need to revascularize them all, or just the vessel that is going to this non-healing ulcer, or two out of three, or three out of three, all revascularizations? So at this point, we don't have the tools to judge this as it is quite subjective information. And I hope that in the future we will have 
remote control tools or sensor implantations or whatever that are telling us, please go on, you didn't, uh, you didn't do enough, you need to go on with your revascularization procedure, we need to have more blood and more ox oxygen in the ulcer environment, this is what I need at the moment. So what we're talking about here is not just diagnostic, but also predictive methodologies. So Manish, do you want to blind us with some science for a moment and just tell us how the data that we're assimilating can develop into these predictive, predictive tools? Well, so um, it's also, I want to actually just quickly touch on about, we, we were talking about under diagnosis and reducing the variability in care. So that's, again, a double-edged sword. So when it comes to these predictive algorithms, some people believe that this could reduce bias, inequality in care, because look, physicians have to be using these technologies from 10 years' time uh, in order to get reimbursed. But then others are saying, well, if you're going to develop these predictive algorithms using data from the past 20 years or from a particular segment of society in terms of patient population, it could be that you're reinforcing the human biases in care already. You're building an algorithm that simply replays what has happened in the past, and it could be people of a certain gender, uh, ethnicity, certain socioeconomic background have had uh, worse care than others for whatever reason and worse interactions. And so you're building that into... So it's kind of really, when it comes to bias and these predictive algorithms, there's a lot of potential, but there's a huge amount of challenges and hurdles that still, are, and even when it, uh, without sort of getting into a long-winded debate about the ethics of relying upon a predictive algorithm where nobody, not even the physician, the people who make the algorithm, who let the artificial intelligence run wild, nobody knows how it actually achieves that result or that diagnostic code. And so that black box of medicine that you know, we could be moving into is both exciting because it offers brand new possibilities, but it's also very frightening to a lot of people because um, we don't yet know how we're going to regulate it or how it will be managed, especially as Kuhn has mentioned, what if things go wrong? Who is legally liable if the decision tool in the intervention says go a bit further and it was a validated tool? That's interesting, isn't it? And it talks to the distrust sometimes, sometimes of the, the future. And when we're looking into the future, there are two views. There are the utopian views and there are the dystopian views. And I think we've now had, we've had that in this conversation. Um, but going to look to the future, and we are currently at the point of this, I think, I just want to talk a bit about health data. Because I think one thing that the COVID-19 especially has accelerated. We've touched on telemedicine already, but we're talking about non-traditional data sources. We've talked a bit about follow-up. We've talked about adherence to prescribed treatments, lifestyle changes, et cetera. And we're talking a bit about monitoring patients and preventing recurrences. So there are many non-traditional data sources, and, and we've touched on some of these already. Um, I'm actually going to pass the floor over to um, Manish, to talk to us about some of these, because I think that whilst everyone would be comfortable and understanding about the use of smart watches, smartphones, fitness trackers, and the like, there may be people who can't see why a, a television, a refrigerator, a car, or other things might help. But I think you're uniquely positioned to shed some light on this to the uh, the medical community. Yeah, so thanks. So just quickly, in terms of my background and the reason why I'm so passionate about data from outside of the doctor's office or the, or the hospital itself is that when I've been working with, uh, in clinical research, working with data from electronic health records, we, we might see uh, a patient coming in and having a, a diagnosis in January, then we don't see a record of them coming in until another six months and seeing the cardiologist. What for me as a researcher, what happens in those six months in the real world? So it's and it's it's looking beyond even just saying we're going to link primary care data to secondary care data to maybe mortality data to something else. It's actually what about if we could link the electronic medical record to data from sensors such as in a car? I've spoken to car manufacturers. Some of them are working on potentially a way of monitoring your heart rate 
as you're driving either through the steering wheel or through sensors in the seats and then telling you, uh, you know, you're too stressed on your commute, pull over and maybe have some meditation or mindfulness, whatever it might be. But the point is that also when it comes to, I was thinking about um, how, can we, how can we determine if somebody is starting to suffer from insomnia or some change in their sleep pattern, I was thinking about some of these video streaming services that we watch and these companies, which are tech companies, this video streaming company knows what time people are stopping to watch these movies every Friday, Saturday night, whatever. So suddenly they can know in real time somebody's uh, as a proxy of what time somebody's going to bed. Well, they're now stopping watching uh, their movies on a Friday night. They're, they're, they're watching until 3 a.m. And so it could be that this insomnia has been triggered by some side effect relating to the actual medication they're taking. But this health data that people don't see as health data is sitting in the hands of a company that is completely outside of healthcare. They may not even realize it's health data that's useful and people in healthcare may not realize. So it's about finding, uh, um, it's about seeing these new possibilities and seeing beyond the current boundaries and saying, if we really could dream about filling in those gaps in the electronic medical record, and we really want to be able to understand what happens in between visits to the cardiologist, what are the data sources? Who would we need to collaborate with? What kind of relationships would we need to have to get data from uh, your car about your heart rate as you're driving on the freeway? So that's, that's very interesting. And I think now we're getting to how this all comes together because we've got all the traditional data sources, we've got the history taking, we've got the blood work, we have radiological investigations, we may have other tests that have also been done. You augment that with whatever can be measured by, by wearables, and we've heard also about implantable sensors from Cone. All of that goes into, you know, the mind boggles the amount of data that's there. And this is where, and I hesitate to use the term artificial intelligence. It is banded around a lot at the moment as the answer to everything. But this really is its utility where you have a lot of data and the human eye or an Excel spreadsheet cannot link together all the important parts to show, to, to give us patterns, to show us trends and to show us how things might be improved and, and to synthesize all those data to integrate it. And I think this is where we begin to see the power of these external sources coming in to give us some real-time flavor over and above what are slightly static impressions of patients. So we talked a lot about this and also talked about some of the legalities. One thing I do just want to highlight is that although we all are very excited about wearables and sensors, these are data gaps that can be filled with patients' compliance bearing in mind all the things we've said uh, we, we spoke with Kern about the patient doctor contract and legalities you know the patients may not want to you know input their symptoms I I into a tablet or a computer they may not want to wear a smartwatch um but we need to resolve some of the patient concerns around the sharing of personal data i'm just going to read you these three facts it's very interesting so 92 percent of patients strongly agreed or agreed that anonymous data collection and sharing is important for future generations. So that's great. People understand that. 90% strongly agree or agree that everyone can benefit from data from other patients as science evolves. So there's a great, great understanding. But here's the stumbling block. 23% of patients strongly agree or agree, I don't want my information shared, even if it's private. So that is a medical, legal, or regulatory conundrum. Cohn, any thoughts on how we might address this or any thoughts around this? Yeah, it's, it, it, I, I don't have a solution right at the moment uh, uh, on this, but it, it was a really striking information for me to, to see that one out of four is just saying why, why people are saying this, that I don't want my information shared, because it is they don't trust us. They don't trust the system. They don't trust these uh, these uh, databases. So, so one out of four, it means that there is a lot of work to do to convince these people that the system is trustable, that it works perfectly, and that it's only made to make the system more efficient and to increase their satisfaction. Natalia, you talked about your patient with the 
rather disjointed information flow. What about this dichotomy of the understanding that the information can help others but not wanting to share it? Yeah, for me it was surprising as well because again, it, this is the reflection that there is some miscommunication in the healthcare system, right? We work as administrators, physicians, patients, but uh, what is the, um, like the goal for the whole group? Uh, we don't know. And, and again, we would love to see a lot of data, but patients may not want to share that data. Administrators may not know how to use that data, like in terms of uh, give more satisfaction, efficiency, and, and other things. So there is a huge gap in our communication as well. What do we want and how we are going to manage that? And, and which is true about all of these devices to get data, is like the patients have um, our challenge as well to know what these devices are going to record, what these devices are going to share, and they are challenged to understand and know and, uh, and all of those things. So some patients may not be interested in, in, in understanding that as well. So yeah, it's very, it, it, like this is just showing how the goals for the whole group are different right now, and we need to integrate that. Manish, can you give us the view from the other side of the fence? Yeah, so what I'm going to say is that there have been these national healthcare patient data sets, these initiatives around the world, different countries have tried and said, we're going to try and create this one big data set and have everything in there. Um, and the trouble is that the reason why though that those 23% don't feel comfortable is that these have been paternalistic solutions, just saying, look, we don't need to involve you or consult you or even be transparent about how this data is going to be used. We're just going to do it. And we know what's best for you. And given back to we were talking about the democratization of healthcare, again, when it comes to whether it's an individual hospital saying we plan to link this data set together with this data set, or it's a country, or even things happening globally, if Unless patients are involved, they're consulted, these systems are co-created, co-designed from the beginning with patients as partners, and also with full transparency about where this data is flowing, what, how can you uh, get it deleted if you're, if you're not comfortable with it being somewhere, uh, what value you're going to get out of it, etc. Until all of that happens, I'm, I suspect this percentage of 23% will only go up over time unless that trust is built up between the system and patients. And I think trust is really a key word here. And there are so many regulatory hurdles, but you know, let's not get stuck on the hurdles. There is an opportunity here. We've got to think about ways that we can do this rather than reasons that we can't. So I think just the final area that I want to examine, and I'm mindful that we are approaching the top of the hour, I want to respect the audience as well as our experts' time. Just to touch very briefly on re-examining what are the optimal outcomes. Now, one thing that came across quite strongly from the survey was that patients view themselves as living in a different world to physicians. And I think, as the physicians on this, uh, on this call will agree, our world is made up of clinical trials, of hard endpoints, of patients having heart attacks or strokes or limb amputations. And those are the things that we measure in clinical trials. But that may not be the most important thing. And I don't mean to do any of those things down for one moment, but that may not be the most important thing to any individual patient. And their expectations of healthcare may be very, very different to what is, if you like, drilled into us by the clinical trial experience. And of course, we've talked already about sort of shared decision making, the role that data, the role that informatics and imaging can play in some of those things. But I think this is all down to a dialogue, isn't it, between the physician and their patient. Cohen, I think you had some insights into patients in particular with peripheral arterial disease where this is important. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I cannot say it better than you mentioned it, uh, Nick. Uh, we, we need, as physicians, I'm sure that we need to act a little bit as a translator. We have on one side, like you mentioned, the clinical trials. If I look at my uh, uh, vascular surgery uh, department and, and, and research, we have late lumen loss. We have primary patency based on peak systolic velocity measurements. Uh, we, we have all these kind of hard outcome parameters, 
but we need to translate this uh, on a daily basis into quality of life and quality of life for our patients for for the patients if you ask them number one is freedom from reintervention they don't want to come back and back and back to the hospital and to our uh, vascular suite uh, they they want to have a durable treatment but beside this uh, they also translate this into um, quality of life parameters they need to, um, to, to to be able to shop to visit their relatives their family that's also a very important outcome parameter uh, compared to our hard scientific uh, outcomes Natalia as a, another practicing physician tell me this must this must make sense to you i've seen it several times in my career where patients are actually less bothered about how long they're going to live it's all about what's my life going to be like over the next six months 12 months 18 months two years yeah these optimal outcomes makes me remember one of my patients that uh he is still he's 95 and when he came to me with his heart attack um this is like, we shouldn't make decisions for our patients ad hoc many times, mostly in complex procedures, right? We, we have to respect that time when we talk to the patient and say, I just diagnosed this on you, this is quite complex. What do you want me to do for you? Because this story remembers me, and uh, he was 92 years old when he came to the cat lab with the heart attack, and I just felt he's very fragile at his age, I, I don't want to do complex procedures. I will just talk to him and just recommend some medications, this and that. So when I had this discussion with him, he looked at me and said like, uh, I don't want you to think about me as an 92 because the outcome for me, and I will remember you if I'm able to play golf again, because that's my happiness. So I'm willing to go through dialysis through like, if you had to do CPR on me, if I had to end that in a, in an intensive, intensive care unit if I had a bleeding as an outcome from this, but I want to play golf again. So that's what matters to me. And that day I was encouraged and I said, okay, let's do whatever needs to be done because that was the outcome for a 92 year old. So we shouldn't make decisions on our own because we are thinking about the outcome, mortality, morbidity, like from the studies, we should just think about the outcome of the patient and what he wants to achieve as the outcome and have that conversation, that's a very important point. So this is one thing, Manish, where maybe technology does not have the answer. That whole business of unconscious bias, or, or can we teach machines and algorithms that also? Well, um, actually, I so on this particular topic, um, I remember a, a tweet from a patient with a rare disease, and she had tweeted a few years ago to say, why doesn't my physician ask me what health means to me? And in particular, so given what Natalia just mentioned, that story with her patient, what Kuhn said earlier about protecting the sanctity of this patient-doctor relationship, this very, the, with, and, and going back to, if we forget technology for a second, we've discussed it a lot, but it is really about what, whatever choices we make as an industry, as a community here, with all these new possibilities of technology and data and algorithms, it's really about how do we how do we ensure we retain, not only retain, but how do we ensure we maximize and create a space for more humanity in healthcare, despite that everything is becoming more data driven. Thanks, Manish. And that's a great segue into just the wrap up, if you like. So I think from everything we've we've seen from the data that's in the white paper, from what we've discussed today, there is little doubt that technology can bring doctors closer to each other and also closer to patients. By providing the right kind of technological assistance at the right time in the patient journey, the medical technology industry can enable more precise diagnoses, aid in the correct treatment strategy being prescribed and lasting patient outcomes to be experienced that promote wellness. So just imagine the possibilities that could be unlocked through improved data insights across the entirety of the patient journey, rather than just at that discrete time point of the intervention. And data-driven decision-making has the potential to enable providers to consider and treat the patient, and let's face it, the patient recipient of all of this healthcare, the patient more effectively, both from understanding their risk factors and their comorbidities, 
to providing the right and precise and correct diagnosis to make the right treatment decisions and to ensure that they adhere to their post-treatment plan. So, the medical technology industry must try and help physicians and administrators shape better, more personalized patient experiences to improve efficiencies and costs and maintain a high level of care while trying to facilitate the thing of a true care continuum for patients rather than a series of unlinked episodes or interventions. And I hope we've been able to highlight some of these areas as we've spoken today. I just want to leave you once again by saying, if you haven't read the white paper, please do look at uh, cardiovascular.abbott slash beyond intervention for further data on this subject. I'm going to finish with one question before I thank my esteemed panel and indeed the audience for joining us for this webinar today. And feel free to give a short or a long answer. We've talked about all this. Whose responsibility is it to execute it? Natalia. Yeah, this is a, it's a difficult question uh, because there are many things involved and this, this is like a big goal and it will be a big achievement. And uh, it has to be, everybody will have to um, add their own uh, experience and expertise uh, on this uh, journey. And I will say it will be like a team effort and it will be a lot of interaction and communication between all parts. But I wouldn't say it's not only about physicians or patients or administrators or uh, the political uh, issues that we discussed before. It would be like a team effort to, to get this. Cohen, can I ask you to comment? Yeah, I, I, you, you know, in, in, in healthcare in general, um, everywhere where you follow webinars or whatever, multidisciplinarity is always mentioned as uh, one of the key uh, stones to success. Well, I think also here uh, to execute these fantastic ideas and statements that were made during this webinar, multidisciplinarity is, a, is, an, is an essential uh, fact over here also to realize this. And, and um, I, I love in my life, I love quadrangular structures. So I think here also, um, the, the box of, like Natalia mentioned, of um, the administrator, the physician, the politics, political people, and the patient, these four cornerstones are the only people that are able to realize this fantastic future. Manish, I'm going to leave the final word with you. Okay, so I firmly believe that um, the patient and their families and their caregivers will play an increasing role in driving uh, this innovation. But on top of that, it's also about the fact that I mentioned there's going to be there's these non-traditional sources of health data. And in particular, there whether it's startups, whether it's tech giants, whether it's uh, organizations from other sectors, because filling in that gap in the medical record and knowing what's happening in the real world, uh, because data is going to be key to these algorithms, it's going to be the industry is going to have to look at n partnerships with non-traditional entities and say, well, we've never worked with that sector before. And it's actually going to be the big challenge is not even the technology, is not even the data or the algorithms. It's actually the cultural transformation of all these different organizations. We're talking about a hospital. We're talking about a med tech company. We're talking about government. We're talking about regulators who it's a long journey and a consistent effort required to actually win the hearts and minds of everyone in those organizations to say, we need to be open to these new possibilities. Join us. And I think that's a great way to end. So on that message, it's a joint responsibility. It's a joint journey. It may be a lofty goal, but we have to be optimistic and we have to start from somewhere. So this is as good a place as any. I'd like to thank everyone today for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this. I'd like to thank Natalia, Cohn, and Manish for all their interaction. It's been a great discussion. Goodbye. We'd like to welcome you to our next uh, in the series of webinars on this uh, topic of Beyond Intervention, and we'll let you know about that as it becomes available. Please watch this space for further chapters and white papers. Please stay safe at this time and take care. Thanks for joining us.